And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in spoke, they They trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of the Lord will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. This week, I think for for all of us who were um, maybe looking at things online or watching the news or visiting people who were 99 years old, the deep significance of the 6th of June 1944 has been rammed home to us in a really good and helpful way. That was an incredible day. It was a day that resonated around the whole of Europe. War had been raging for five years, but for the very first time, the Allied countries allowed themselves to think a thought that they had not thought before. They'd have hoped, but wouldn't have dared put it into words. We're going to win. We're going to win. In that moment, through that offensive into Normandy, the will and the spirit and the might of the Nazi war machine was pushed back. And though victory wasn't declared that day, it was assured because of what happened in that moment. Hope, seemingly lost, was starting to grow again. People would talk about what life would be like after the war. Those conversations had finished. It felt like war was the new normal. And yet, a time was coming when we could think about life in the light of victory. The enemy will be defeated and we can live again. See, the Christian life is all about what it looks like to live in the light 
of victory. Sin and death have been defeated by Christ. The cross, the central moment in all of human history, has guaranteed victory. Hope is born. And as we begin to grasp the new situation, the new status that we have, the question arises, what does it look like to live for God? What does it look like to live in the light of this victory that has been won for us by Christ? And whether you've been a Christian for decades or whether from a Christian point of view, you're kind of still on the sidelines watching in and interested but not fully committed, it's a question that all of us need to answer. What does it look like to live for God? See, it's the reason that we're doing this series. These huge questions, who is God? What is he like? What does it mean to live for him? Are answered in the Bible. And the Old Testament, it lays the foundation. It introduces us to God. It prepares us for the climax of the story, the coming into the world of the Lord Jesus Christ. No story is more important. And every other story flows from this most glorious of stories. So let's recap a little bit of what we've seen so far. God made the world. He made everything that we can see. He made space, the very far ends of the universe, and he declared it very good. He placed Adam and Eve in the center, made in his image to show what he is like. But they chose to live his way, uh, their way rather than God's. They turned their back on their maker, and it led to them being sent out of the garden with sin and death entering the world. Humanity demonstrated they couldn't fix the problem of a broken world. It just led to more sin and more death. So God took the first step. He made a huge promise to Abraham, promising that through his family, the whole world would be blessed. God made the same promise to Abraham's son, Isaac, and then to his son, Jacob. And he changed Jacob's name to Israel. He had 12 sons, one of whom was Joseph, the guy with the fancy coat, who was sold as a slave to Egypt by his brothers. Now, by God's power, Joseph rose to be prime minister in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. And when a famine hit the region, because of the way the Lord had worked through Joseph, because of his wisdom, Egypt had plenty of food, and so people from the surrounding nations would come and would get all they needed from Egypt. And so Joseph's family came from the land given to Abraham, and they set up home in Egypt. 400 years pass, and that 70-odd strong family is now a nation of around 2 million people, yet they're slaves in Egypt. They're oppressed by Pharaoh, the king, and forced to act as his workforce. But God hears the cry of his people, and he calls Moses, a man raised in Egypt, yet exiled to the wilderness because of his sin, and tells him that through him, God will rescue his people. And that is seen in an awesome display of power as God demonstrates that the gods that the Egyptians worship are nothing before the one true God. And he brings his people out through the Passover, through the, uh, the Red Sea, out into the wilderness, come to rescue, uh, to worship him. And as we saw last week, he brings them to the base of Mount Sinai. And he brings them together as a nation and declares them to be his loved, his cherished people. And the nation will remain there for almost a year. And during that time, God gives his people the law, over 600 commands, summed up in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. The people have been saved from Egypt, given identity and purpose, and are now being shown what it looks like to live for God. Understanding who he is, understanding what he says, and understanding the distance between God and the people. And as we see this ancient revelation given to Egypt, uh, given to Israel, three and a half thousand years old, will be pointed to the perfect revelation of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll see together what it means to live for him each and every day. So let's see first that this is to understand who he is, is to live for our God. Again, these words that I read at the beginning, as chapter 20 begins, these are some remarkable words. These things kind of wash over us. We take them for granted, and yet this is amazing. Chapter 20 and verse 1, and God spoke all these words. Do you remember back in Genesis 1, 
God's words brought everything into being, and God said, and God said, and it was done, and it was so. And the God who called all these things into being is now speaking to his people. He helps them to understand who he is. Verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Remember that when we see the Lord in capital letters, it takes us back to the moment when God called Moses to lead the people. Moses asked God, what is your name? And he said, the Lord, Yahweh, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. In his name, he reveals he is faithful. He is trustworthy. He is unchanging. That everything he has always been, he will always be. We might hear a spouse say, they aren't the person that I married. Or someone say, a friend, they've really changed. Yet that is never true of God. He is always the same God. The love and the compassion that we see in the Passover as he rescues his people. He is that God today and eternally. The power and the justice we see as Israel crosses the Red Sea. He is eternally that God. In an ever-changing world, he is the sure and the certain foundation. Yet this God who spans all of time, who is the mighty creator God, is intimately relational. Did you see that? I am the Lord, your gods. You were forced to worship the gods of Egypt, but I, I am your gods. He comes near and he speaks because there is deep connection. See too, the personal, unchanging, relational God, he is also the saviour. The vast God, the close God, he is the saving God. He brought the Israelites out of Egypt where they were slaves. And with everything in that saving act, he is revealing something of who he is. He is the eternal, intimate, saving God. See, before the giving of the law came a declaration from God that he was in a relationship with the people that he had saved. As Josh pointed out last week, salvation comes before holiness. How do we live for God? We come to him in helplessness first. Without salvation, there is no holiness. And this has implications in so many areas of life. How often do we expect holiness from people who aren't saved? We should regularly be saddened by the depths of the human heart, but we should never be surprised. You can't expect people to live in a spirit-filled way without the spirit. Holiness is seen not because somebody has worked out the best way of living. It's because the spirit of God is working within them. Pleasing God can only come after someone has been saved. Parents both biological parents, but spiritual parents in the church family? Are we expecting Christ-like behavior from kids when they aren't saved? And when we inevitably don't see it, do we, do we kind of double down on behavior modification rather than gospel-shaped child rearing, which works in our children to help them understand who God is and praise that he would save them and that he would grow in them that Christ-like nature that we see in those who have been saved. See, our first step in living for God is to understand who he is. Not behavior, not effort, but him. It is about him. It's very easy to read Exodus 20 and think Christianity is about a set of rules. No, 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 no. It's about a relationship with the God who made all things, who comes near and speaks to his people. I wonder, do you see that? Have you grasped something of the glory of God? Have you seen something of who he is? Or have you got bogged down with the behavior changing program when actually it's about God? Do you see the glory of the one who saves? As a church, from time to time, we run Christianity Explored courses, which are those opportunities to come and to ask, to see this God in action, to understand who he is, to understand what he says to his people. We're starting one in the next couple of weeks. I'd love to talk to you about that course if you want to get involved and understand something of who God is. He is the mighty God. And it is a glory to know him closely. And once we see who he is, 
we then need to understand what he says. See, when people speak, we hear something of their heart. We get to understand what they love and what they don't love. We get to see what they value in their lives. And these words are here to show us what God values, what is precious, what is special to God. And so therefore, to live for him is to value what he values. So it's to listen and to value what he values. And we see that in the Ten Commandments. See, the first four of these commands, they show us how much he values his relationship with his people. Verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Before, it kind of means over or above. And far from being arrogant, it's just a statement of what is best for us. Life is better when God is number one. The Bible just presents that as a statement of fact because it's true. He's the God who made us, who made everything that we see. Of course that. We were designed for him. We saw that in Genesis 1 and 2. And so it is right that God is number one. This continues in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. See, the people weren't to make idols because it would lead worship in the wrong direction. See, the Lord loves his people. He knows that life to the full is found in him, in connection with him, in worship of him. And he wants families to have a legacy of love for God rather than hatred and rebellion. I wonder what legacy are you leaving in your family? What view of God are you giving in your family? Fathers, what view of God the Father are you giving your kids of what God is like? There is a legacy that is left in families. And those of us in the particular generations, we get to leave that legacy, to build that legacy. What kind of legacy are we leaving? And then the third commandment sums up what we've seen Verse 7, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. In these times, a name encapsulated the very heart of a person. It's why name changing is such a thing in the Old Testament, because it signals a transformation from one way of life to another. And here, in the name of the Lord, as we've seen a little bit already, it sums up, gives us a big picture of who God is. So when you insult someone's name, you insult the very heart of who they are. That word translated misuse in that verse is related to falsehood. Israel is guarded against living in a way that presents a false view of the Lord. We have to prevent a view of God, present a view of God that is his, that is him on display, not some version of God that we've made up ourselves. What does it look like to live for God? Look at Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. It is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That is what it looks like. That's how you sum up these commandments. It's what the first three are about. And the fourth was Israel's way of putting that into action. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. What was going on here? This was about dependence. We aren't God and we need to take a break. You can't work seven days a week. That's what was going on. It's about relationship, that in the busyness of life, there should be specific and quality time to spend with the Lord. And it was about a reset into how things were always supposed to be. It takes us back to the very beginning. Do you remember when we looked at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, that on that seventh day, God looked at all that he had made, and it was very good, and he blessed that day, and he rested. And Adam and Eve were to live in God's rest, They were to work and to serve and to be husband and wife and to relax and to do everything in the midst of God's rest. 
the rest from being completely in charge, the rest of having the weight of the universe upon your shoulders because it's on God's and he can handle it. But life wasn't like that for Israel. They'd been slaves and now they're in the wilderness. They were distant from their promised land. And so God said, just take a moment. Just take a moment where you get a glimpse of how it is supposed to be. You're dependent upon me. You should be focused upon me. But let me excite you about what is going to happen. That's what the Sabbath was all about. See, God values relationship with his people, but he also values quality relationships between his people. That's what the next six commandments are about. They're the horizontal. We've had the vertical between God and us. Now it's the horizontal between us and each other. And in that, we see what God values. Look at verse 12. Honor your father and mother that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. God values family and marriage relationships. He values honesty and integrity and truth and contentment. Why? Because that's who he is. As we look at these commands, we see something of God himself. And we become realigned. Remember, we've seen all the way through, the problem is that we're not aligned with the God who made us. But this begins to place us back into who he is. As those made in his image and rescued from slavery, Israel was to display to the world what it looked like to have the Lord as king. That was their calling. And they were to do it by understanding who God is, understanding what he said, and then living it out to put it into action. Here's how this section is brought together in Leviticus chapter 19. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. See, through the law, God showed more of who he is to Israel. He showed them his heart. He showed them his values. And he called them to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. In the wilderness, the people had kind of got themselves their own little view of God, grumbling that he was mean and that he didn't want to give them good things and that he should have just left them in Egypt. But here in this moment, God says, no, 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 you don't know the half of who I am, but I'm going to show you. So the question is, do you value what God does? Do your values and the way that you live Demonstrate that you are in intimate connection with God. As you look over that list, is your heart where God's is? Part of my job is to spend time with people who are dying. And in that moment, you get to see what somebody values. When everything else has been stripped away, when actually all of those things that the world says you should value have all kind of faded away, what is it that's left in that moment? John Carey wanted to hear God's words read. Christine Young wanted to share communion as an outworking of her love for Jesus, her desire to be pointed to the cross. In those moments when everything else is shown to be worthless, what will you show that you value? Will there just be nothing? Because everything that you value will be eliminated through death. And the thing is, now is the time to invest. God has spoken. God has not left us in the dark. We don't need to wonder what God is like. We don't need to wonder what he says because it is here. He has shown his heart and we have the opportunity to join him. I hope you're excited about talking to Chris and to Ruth about safe families. I hope you're way more excited about going on an adventure with God. The one who made all things calls you into a relationship with him and says, we're going to go places together. Are you with me? What a prospect that is. What a prospect to worship the God who made us. But back at Mount Sinai, there was a problem. 
Last week, Josh drew our attention to the response of God's call. Flip back to chapter 19 and verse 8. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. You can just imagine this. They're all together. They're all inspired. Moses has channeled his inner Chris, and everyone's brilliant. It's fantastic. It's amazing. We're going to go for it. Except it doesn't go quite to plan. Look at verse 18 from our passage. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. See, the problem is, when God shows himself to humanity, it is terrifying. It is genuinely terrifying. We've lost that in our Christian culture. We don't understand that to to see God is like taking a spaceship into the center of the sun. The holy God is a vast and a mighty God. He is majestic and holy and righteous. He is pure. And in his presence, sinners are destroyed. The people hear from God and they're fearful. They want to stand at a distance. God's purity, it cultivates fear. God is intimidating. He is overwhelming. He is scary. And so they come up with a solution, verse 19. And they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us or we will die. They need a go-between. They need a mediator, someone to stand between them and God so they can hear from God, but not in a particularly scary way. See, the people can cope with Moses. They don't mind talking to Moses. And so if Moses can go and talk to God and then toddle back to them and they can tell them what God says, they can cope with that uh, and, and that will be all right. He can pass on what God says. And what are Moses' very first words? Verse 20, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. See, Moses has been in the presence of this terrifying God, the one who cultivates all of this fear. And what does he say? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. See, this is what makes him such a good go-between. See, he understands something of God, and he understands the people, and he can bring them together. He can be used by God to draw Both sides together. Verse 20, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and to keep you from sinning. You see, sin is the great problem. It's the separator that causes the distance. And God is all about removing it. That was the purpose of the promise to Abraham. It's the purpose of the promise back in Genesis 3, that one would come who would crush the head of the serpent. Sin is our heart desire to live with ourselves in control rather than God. To not love him as we should. To not love our neighbor as ourselves. And God can't let it continue. It is unjust to live in God's world without him as number one. He works to keep us from sinning. But as our passage ends, there's a somber note that sets the tone for the rest of the Old Testament. Verse 21. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. The distance is still there. We've had this glorious commissioning in chapter 19. We've had the giving of the law in chapter 20, and yet the distance is still there. And even Moses, he approaches God in thick darkness. That doesn't sound like fun times with God, does it? See, from the moment Adam and Eve sinned and hid themselves in the trees, there was a distance between humanity and God. One that the law couldn't remove. See, the rest of the Old Testament, it shows Israel's sketchy relationship with the law. And even those who seek to keep it, they find a distance between themselves and God. Something more is needed. Something deeper than what we've just read. Something that the prophets spoke about, particularly Jeremiah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their gods, and they will be my people. What was written here on tablets of stone was going to be written on hearts and written on minds. And 1,500 years after Moses goes up the mountain to bring God's revelation to the people, Jesus Christ went up a mountain to do the same. 
What was interesting, though, was that whereas Moses pointed to God, Jesus, while talking about God, he seemed to also point to himself in a way that kind of put himself on a level with God. And as he talked about the law, he said these words. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. See, the law was good. It was a gift from God to Israel. But because of the hearts of the people, it was temporary. It couldn't do that deep down work, that inner transformation. It was a shadow of what Jesus was going to bring in fulfillment. The law showed something of God's heart. We see it fully in the person of Jesus. The law was God's word to Israel. Jesus is his eternal word to everyone. The law told Israel how to live. But Jesus is life for everyone. See, Jesus was faithful where Israel wasn't, keeping the law perfectly and fulfilling the purpose for which it was given. You see, his death was a paradox. The perfect law keeper was killed for breaking the law. The king was executed for treason. Yet in his death, he put, took upon himself every moment where I don't love God with all that I am, every time I don't love my neighbor as I love myself. And on the third day, he rose again, the first of a new people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, showing how to live for God and giving the power to do so, writing the commands, writing the values of God upon our hearts. Are the Ten Commandments where we need to go to see how to live for God? No. And you think, oh, that's a relief because it's quite a high bar. Actually, it's higher than that. We go to Jesus. See, his perfection, his obedience, his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness, his gentleness, his self-control. That's what it looks like to live for God. And that's impossible. See, our sin keeps us at a distance, and seeing Jesus' perfection only makes it worse. See, the law says don't murder, but Jesus says harboring anger is just as separating. The law says don't commit adultery, but Jesus says lustful thoughts maintain the distance that is there. We can't come near. We can't live as we should. We need a mediator, a go-between. See, if Jesus was simply our example, if it was simply look at Jesus and that's the way to live, his coming would be an act of cruelty, showing us what we could never do, giving us this standard that is impossible for you and for me to keep. But he isn't simply our example. He's our go-between, our great high priest, the unique God-man who brings God to us and us to God. His death defeats sin. His resurrection defeats death. And the gift of his spirit means that both the presence and the power of God are within us. His law is written upon our hearts. What does it look like to live for God? An acceptance that you can't. A giving of your whole life to Jesus. Trusting that in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension, that he has won for you all that is needed to know God and to live for him and a submission to his spirit as he works in you to make you more like Jesus, to grow that Christ-likeness that you cannot grow for yourself. You see, the Passover, it led to ancient Israel's liberation. D-Day led to modern Europe's liberation. But the cross of Christ stretches across all of time and all of space, freeing people like you and like me to live the life that God always intended us to live, a life close to him. So whether for the first time or the thousandth time, come to Christ, give yourself to him, and find the power to live the life that you can't live yourself, the power to live in a way which pleases God. The power to love your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. The power to love your neighbor as yourself. The power that says you can be like 
your gods because of Jesus.